So um, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, before I begin, uh, I would like to acknowledge first my uh, co-authors, uh, Dr. Uh, Christina, Christina Epetia, um, Ms. Anarita Vargas, and Mr. Uh, Ms. Anarita Vargas, sorry, and Mr. John Joseph Ognina. So our paper um, essentially uh, is uh, an input to the uh, Philippine Tibet. Uh, no, uh, actually, this is not so Philippine Labor Market Information System and. Um, uh, test the skills needs anticipation. So next slide, please. Okay, so the research objective of the paper is actually very simple. We just uh, we want uh, that we wanted to uh, provide inputs to the test the um, skills anticipation and prioritization of skills requirements framework or what we call SAPS R. Uh, next slide, please. So. Just to have an idea, uh, this is the uh, framework that we received from TESDA. Um, so you can see here that there's an input. Uh, there, there are three elements in the framework of the skills anticipation framework, the input, the process, and the output. So um, the they have TESDA actually has a proposed labor market information uh, system design. Uh, and then this uh, LMI system has three uh, in, uh, outputs, national skills map, skills uh, skills requirement, and the supermarket of competencies. And this is supposed to be an input to the, the framework itself. And so overall, this is the, the framework that TESDA has asked us to provide inputs to, and that is uh, that and that we're going to do in, in, in a bit. But before we, we do that, um, next slide, please. We are already heard a lot of buzzwords like for example the skills need anticipation and labor market information system so let me just take a step back um and uh, articulate the um, bigger issue in which uh, we need to this why why are we discussing uh, labor market information system and skills need anticipation so what is the bigger context and the bigger context would be uh, skills mismatch so uh, skills mismatch is defined by ILO as um, it's a bit, essentially a discrepancy between skills demand and supply so it can come in the form of skills gap obsolescence shortages um, vertical mismatch, which is a, a mismatch between educational uh, achievements, and then horizontal mismatches between uh, skills type. And, and it's important for us to understand what's uh, to uh, understand what uh, the causes of uh, sorry the it's important for us to uh, address skills mismatch because there are adverse effects at the individual level, uh, meaning if you are overqualified, chances are uh, do, doing something that the, that you're overqualified for, then you, you can have lower job satisfaction because you 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 essentially have wage penalties. And at the firm level, um, skills mis mismatch can result in the the uh, lower firm productivity, um, and then under investment in innovation, and then of course higher labor uh, turnover. And then as a whole uh, as a as a whole, whole economy, then um, there's a problem in terms of lower productivity, uh, lower competitiveness, higher unemployment and underemployment rates. Um, and then, and the reason for skills mismatch is that um, because information is incomplete and imperfect. So that is that is one of the key reasons why there is skills mismatch. Uh, information about uh, the skills demand and supply uh, or job occupation, uh, job jobs and occupation skills. Uh, the demand for jobs and occupations are 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 incomplete and imperfect. And and because it is uh, some sort of market failure, like uh, uh, labor and information market failure, then there is a role for the government to intervene. Um, and and that is one solution. Government intervention uh, but even though it is it falls under the public sphere then it require it requires the participation of various stakeholders for example from the industry private sector academia in order for us to move forward with a better solution and and so ne next slide please in the Philippines, we just wanted to highlight that in, even in the 1970s uh, skills mismatch has already been identified as an issue <laughs> and then 50 years onward, the issue remains. So, and then that is something that Ms. Dr. Ballesteros uh, pointed out, Dr. Sonny pointed out, and even uh, Dr. Lawrence are, uh, pointed out. These are already pointed out by PID studies and pointed out by by uh, ADB studies and even uh, private sector. So it it, it was there in the uh, 1970s and then five decades. Now the problem is still there. Um, 
And again, um, what we can say is that a mismatch is is something that is um, uh, 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 a problem of information. It is a problem of imperfect and incomplete information, and therefore it can be mitigated by a well-functioning labor market information system. Which brings us to the next slide. So, uh, what exactly is labor market information system? So, uh, labor market. First, what is labor market information? Labor market information is any quantitative or qualitative information uh, that uh, will tell us anything about labor market. So for example, those that are um, published by PSA, unemployment, under employment, and those that are published by the uh, DOLE, for example, on-demand jobs and hard-to-fill jobs, those are labor market information. Um, but when we talk of labor market information system, um, this essentially revolves around the processes to make the information useful. So it's a processes to make the information useful for policymakers, industries, um, and even to students and parents. So it's not just the data, but it it, it involves how the data are collected uh, and then processed, uh, stored, and retrieved, and dis disseminated. So next slide, please. Okay, so now what is the connection between uh, L L LMIS and SNA. Um, first, there are uh, the labor market information system, it has uh, many functions. The first two functions that we've listed there, um, the LMIS is just a tool. It's just a tool for labor market analysis. It's just a tool for to aid monitoring and reporting. But the third one is um, more, it, it's highly evolved in the sense that it no, it, it, it's not just a tool, but rather it's a mechanism to facilitate information exchange and collaboration among stakeholders and institutions. Now, what is SNA? SNA uh, refers to activities that assess current and future skills needs in the labor market. And SNA is actually a bigger part, uh, it's a part of the, the, the bigger uh, or broader labor market information system. Um, so here we can see that um, there are key elements, in, uh, uh, sorry, the LMIS has key uh, elements, uh, data, methods and tools, analytical capacity. And then there's the overarching institutional capabilities and social dialogue. Um, and these key elements, because it, the, it governs the labor market information system, it also governs the skills needs anticipation uh, as a assessment and anticipation. And, and as such, this is actually the basis of our inputs to the test does uh, skills anticipation and prioritization of skills uh, uh, framework later. But before uh, we proceed to, to that, let, let me just share some good practices um, in the SNAs and LMIS first. So next slide, please. So the first, uh, the first uh, good practice that we noticed is, of course, because we're talking of labor market information system, uh, is data. Um, uh, we noticed that uh, we observed that most countries they use graduate tracer studies because it it actually is forms the connection between the education sector, and uh, can you still hear me? Hello, sorry. Yes, Doctor Connie, please continue. Okay, sorry because something pops in my screen. So anyway, anyway, so. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that uh, we observed, it based on our uh, reading of the literature, that graduate tracer studies are very important because it forms the connection between the education sector and the labor market. Uh, it, uh, it, benchmark, it, it benchmarks institutional performance. It helps in improving uh, curriculum responsiveness to the labor market demand. And then we also observed that uh, public and private employment services are being used by other countries. It, it, it's actually providing job matching uh, services to job seekers and employers. And then another uh, good practice that we notice is that um, countries are already moving toward big data analytics and non-traditional data collection strategies. Um, of course, we know the traditional data sources. We, we, we wanted that because they are generally representative of the population. And um, but sometimes it take uh, it takes a lot of time before it can be finished and 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 so it lacks the um it lacks the advantage of offering real time information and updates uh, and at the same time uh it it is rather at the same time it most often than not it it lacks the necessarily necessary granularity of the data that we wanted uh, in terms of analyzing um skills so um and, and so the other countries are already harnessing big data 
um, using the online job vacancies and job seeker credentials. Oh, what I just wanted to point out here is that there are disadvantages uh, in, in harnessing big data because um, postings are usually coming from the formal sector. And so for a developing country like the Philippines with in high in very high informal uh, sector, uh, it can, can result in um, underestimation. Uh, at the same time, there are multiple postings which can, uh, or the reverse result in uh, uh, overestimation. Naman. And, and so th those are the things that we've noticed in terms of uh, uh, big data. Next slide, please. Okay, so in terms of collaboration and engagements, um, we uh, noted that countries are doing stakeholder and ex uh, ex uh, expert consultations and it, and then this is good because it complements the quanti quality, sorry, the quantitative data. And then the, um, uh, there are also a lot of sectoral involvement going on in the process of uh, their development of the labor market information system. Um, and, and this is good in, because it ensures co the complementarity of strategies among sectors. And at the same time, it enhances the interoperability of data systems. Um, at the same time, we noticed that it's very important for 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 um, to have for uh, the the LMIS development of LMIS to have sectoral involvement because it helps to set boundaries, meaning it prevents the overlapping of tasks and and and, th and thus in the process maximize resources. So in terms of dissemination um, practices, uh, we lab the, we not we observe that. Most uh, uh, most uh, countries are leveraging dashboards and visualization tools. So, uh, and then in terms of financial resources and uh, sustainability, we noted that countries with longer term uh, funding they tend to have more comprehensive work plans and established data collection systems. And which which this can be very challenging uh, for for developing countries like the Philippines because sometimes more most often than that, um, the initiatives like this can have low priority and and it can be re, uh, uh, prone to budget cuts um and we also noticed that partnership and and strategic financial planning are are, are being done in the sense that many countries uh, source uh, their funds for the LMIS and SNA, SNA initiatives using government funds but they also tap um international and domestic collaborations next slide please Okay, so the the third one, um, this is and this is key to our inputs to the test uh, SAPs are we observe two things. Uh, one is that most labor market information system that are well functioning, they have skills taxonomy, and second, they they have skills and occupation mapping. So let us break that down. Uh, break, let us break that down in 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 uh, in in two things. Uh, so skills taxonomy, skills taxonomy is just a system to classify skills. So it. It, it depends on the economy and its labor market structure. So, for example, the ONET that was uh, that was emphasized in the earlier paper, um, it only used two two skills, basic and cross functional. Um, but it has uh, but it has 30, 35 skills all in all, uh, eight of which are classified under the basic math, science, um, speaking, uh, speaking skills, writing skills, comprehension, critical thinking, monitoring, learning strategies. And then under cross-functional skills, there are complex problem solving skills, uh, resource management skills, social skills, system skills, technical uh, technical skills. So they have 35 uh, skills uh, uh, identified all in all. Um, and and the, the good thing about having a skills taxonomy is that it provides structure to data collection. Um, so, and, and then it also facilitates the discussion. Uh, so when, when agencies will, uh, are, are talking, then they know exactly what they're talking about in terms of skills. What, what are the skills that we're talking about? We know because there is this skills taxonomy. So that's that's the first thing. Um, the skills occupation mapping, um, essentially, because they already have the skills taxonomy, they map it with the standard occupational code. Um, and to visualize this, to help us visualize this, um, for example, uh, uh, science and engineering professionals. Um, there are meteorologists, chemists, geologists, mathematicians, uh, uh, statisticians, data scientists, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So each one of these will have skills data. Uh, and uh, I think Dr. Lawrence mentioned something about the importance. So for each skill, uh, for example, uh, speaking skills, there uh, each 
each occupation will be uh, rate uh, each occupation will have some sort of importance in terms of uh, how important is the speaking skills for this kind of occupation. So essentially, to visualize it, it is a matrix of occupation codes and skills. Uh, and the good thing about having skills occupation mapping is that one is that, uh, again, standardized. Everything is standardized. We understand each other when we talk uh, about skills. Um, and then second is that uh, having skills occupation mapping, it enhances the the value of standard data sources and other surveys that do not have skills uh, data skills data content. So, for example, LFS, FIES, or APIS. Um, these these are standard data sources. But when we have the skills occupation mapping, we just have to merge, and then voila, you already have uh, you already have uh, skills data in in LFS, and 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 so we'll be able to do a lot of research uh, to inform policy in terms of labor market dynamics job transitions, uh, transferability of skills, skills dis distribution across a uh, different level of disaggregation. Um, and, and so and then in the next slide, we, uh, sorry, uh, not, not muna, wag muna. Uh, balik tayo, balik. Balik, uh, okay, balik. Balik tayo, okay. So, yan, so, no, go back ulit. Go back, one more. Okay, so we ju I just wanted to to say that here in the ONET, uh, because the ONET is is already emphasized in the first paper, we just wanted to, because I'm really a big fan of this ONET, and be because it helped us uh, uh, visualize kung gaano, how, how far along are we in terms of having skills data. And, and not, oh, I just wanted to say that ONET started in the 1970s. So it did not, ONET is not as comprehensive as it is then, as it is now, but it, it didn't happen overnight. The comprehe its comprehensiveness didn't happen overnight. Um, it, it it took time. It it evolved. But but now it's really comprehensive. It's it's not just a labor market information system. It's helping uh people to chart their career pathways, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the good thing about Onet is that it is used also by other labor market information systems in Europe. It's also used by Canada and and Australia. So next slide, please. Okay, so I uh, just wanted to point out that we have existing uh, LMI and LMIS initiatives here in the Philippines. So, for example, uh, uh, Dole, Dole, they have the uh, jobs fit uh, before, which is now, I, I believe, uh, jobs and labor market forecast. Uh, PhilJobNet and PEIS, we also have that. Uh, PhilJobNet, it facilitates an online uh, job matching uh, pl platform. Um, and, and, uh, and then under... It, PEIS is actually housed in, in that one. PEIS is the uh, Peso Employment uh, Information System. So the only uh, the all, the issues here that we've, we've identified is that um, the one is the representativeness of the demand for skills. Again, on, only uh, re the uh, uh, firms that are registered in the field job net are coming from the formal sector. But we know that we are we have a very high informal economy, and therefore they are um, they are. Um, uh, um, uh, underrepresented, uh, and then Tesla also has uh, has uh, the skills map uh, report. Uh, but uh, the, our issue here is that the skills map sometimes the skills that were identified there uh, sounds to us like it's job like these are jobs or broad, broad occupation categories or knowledge or work activities. So this highlights actually the 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 need for a skills taxonomy that perhaps. I, uh, we as researchers do not understand what what skills are, uh, and and so it, it really highlights the need for uh, taxonomy. And then uh, Philippine Skills uh, Framework Initiative uh, by DTI. Uh, one issue here is that uh, it needs PISOC alignment. It does not use the uh, Philippine Standard Occupational Code, um, and also the dissemination can be improved. Next slide, please. Okay, so now we're ready to go to the insight. I already have, I'm, I'm over time, but I'm already on the overtime, but but please bear with me. Uh, this is These are the inputs uh, to the test of skills anticipation and the uh, prioritization. Next slide. Um, okay, so the L, in terms of elements, maybe perhaps we can go to the, uh, to the, the next slide. Okay, so here, um, what uh, what we can say here is that uh, we've summarized everything, and what we we just wanted to say here is that you can see that the labor market information system, the first thing that we have to do is we need to have skills data foundation, which is something that we do not have. Um, uh, and and so the the first thing that we have to do is to for to to craft a skills taxonomy by using and then map it with the Philippine standard occupation code. Once we have the skills occupation code, then um, we can already take, 
we can already uh, uh we can already make the standard data uh we can already make skills data available in standard data as i've already mentioned lfs we just have to merge and then voila you already have the skills data in standard data um skills occupation mapping is also important in terms of uh in the future, if we wanted to use big data, it's very important as well because big data is just data. Um, it needs structure in terms of uh, in, ter in terms of getting information, valued information, and the skills occupation mapping will help us do that. And so, if we already have the big data, we it can also uh, there's some sort of feedback going on because big data can be used in order to update the skills occupation mapping. And we, we, once we already have the skills occupation mapping, um. We can it it can also guide the qualitative data collection, and, and once we have the data the data right, then we can perform skills forecast. We can perform skills foresight, uh, and then we can uh go we can uh, come up with any out with with the final outputs that we wanted. In this case, for the test the uh, skills anticipation and prioritization of skills requirement framework to craft training regulation and and competency standards development uh and and so this this is the kind of of of, of information that the that, uh, that uh, the kind of information that we provided inputs into the uh test subs are so next slide please so going to the summary and some insights please give me like three minutes more um the comp the young our country we've already identified that uh, there are a lot we have a lot of good data sources um but there's still a lot of improvement. One is that we need to establish a system that uh, recognizes and classifies skills. We need to have skills taxonomy. Uh, and then we need to map this skills taxonomy with standard occupation classification code in order to improve our uh, skills data foundation. And then we we need to collect uh, PESOC at higher disaggregation in a government-initiated surveys. And then we also note the importance of graduate tracer data sets. And we also note that uh, big data use is something, something that is aspirational to the Philippines currently. So next slide, please. Okay, so some insights in terms of institutional arrangements and collaboration, we've identified that in order for the labor market in, uh, information uh, system, uh, information system and SNA initiatives to work, there has to be somebody who, who would hold who holds the stick and then telling people uh, what to do. And and we we've identified Dole to be the the, the agency to do that. So it Odole, it has to oversee the development of skills data foundation, the taxonomy and the mapping that we we're talking about, and, and forge institution institutional arrangements and international partnerships. For in terms of government, then we have to strengthen the the they have to, to strengthen the PESO in terms of coverage and the quality of services they provide. Um other key agencies like Dole, Tesla, Neda, uh, there is a need to cultivate a culture of multi-stakeholders uh, collaboration. Uh, it maximizes the use of resources and it will help, definitely help in the sustaining of the uh, initiatives. Next slide, please. Okay, in terms of data, uh, again, uh, we're emphasizing here, we, we need to develop a skills taxonomy uh, and then, then Dole, Tesla, Neda and other key agencies has to sit down and then talk uh, what are the uh, uh, skills that are relevant for to us. But of course, it has to be participated by uh, the private sector, by the industry, by human uh, resource practitioners, et cetera, et cetera, in, uh, because they know more in terms of uh, what skills are really relevant to the structure of the economy. Um, and in terms of agencies collecting uh, labor market information data, again, uh, use standard classification codes. Uh, we've noticed that, of course, DTI, the, the, the PSF, the Philippine Skills Framework, it, does not, it did not use the uh, PISO. And then for the government, um, it's important for us to institutionalize the collection of the uh, Philippine Identification System or the National ID number in the administrative data. Um, and then the reason, and the reason why we were saying this is that um, if we collect the FILSIS number at salient entry and exit points, like for example, enrollment, graduation, hiring, uh, transfer, participation in training, it will become a powerful to match education and uh, employment outcomes. So we don't have to do actually tracer studies anymore, a uh, tracer surveys anymore. All we have to do is to have a MOA with agencies to get the information needed. Uh, uh, and, and so it, it, it it reduces the need for uh, tracer surveys, which can be very uh, uh, costly to, to collect. And then lastly, next last slide. 
Okay, in terms of dissemination, again, we emphasize that it's very important to use websites and uh, dashboards with visualization tools uh, and links to other knowledge generating sources. And in terms of support, very important. It's very important to have uh, uh, continuous support to sustain the ELMIS and SUPSAR initiative uh, uh, because the availability of long-term funding for ELMIS, uh, it provides a well-thought-out data foundation and a coordinated data collection system. Uh, I think that's the last slide. <laughs> yeah, thank you.